Um, happy Thursday and thanks for tuning in. Um, today, Karen and I will share some lessons that we've learned in the process of doing two linked data projects that are being conducted at OCLC Research. Um, they show us some useful ways to make the transition from MARC to linked data a little bit easier. Just as a side note, um, Karen gave a version of this presentation at the ELEX pre-conference preceding ALA annual last June. So a little bit of logistics. I will do a few intro introductory slides to set things up for the deeper discussion. Then I will hand it over to Karen, who will walk through some examples of what we're talking about with multilingual um, bibliographic descriptions. I will then join in at the end to talk about an example involving audiovisual materials and then give the summary and open it up for questions. And just another FYI, I'm coming in from Dublin, Ohio, and Karen is coming in from San Mateo, California. So to get started, it's the, the, the message is fairly simple. To make good linked data, we need good data. And by that, we mean data that is structured, accurate, and everything else that's mentioned on the slides, all of that, all of that goodness that's mentioned there. Now, of course, you can achieve these goals with MARC, but they aren't an automatic consequence of current cataloging standards. So what we're going to walk through today is a, a set of examples and then arrive at a list of recommendations for converting MARC records to link data more easily by following a, a few conventions that are already defined. So to get started, where, what do we have to do? Well, we have to make our data more machine readable, which is a strange thing to say, actually, given that MARC means machine readable cataloging. And th there's a, a, a truth to that, of course. A MARC record is certainly more machine readable than a physical library card. But the problem is that it is only readable in library systems. And the record itself is only fully understandable to human readers. And so here's a, here's a very um, superficial mock-up, and we'll talk about some real MARC records in the, in the next couple of slides. But, but it shows where we are now and where we need to be. So at the bottom, we have a simple bibliographic description. It's kind of more like a Dublin Core present, presentation than a MARC record, but we all know how to map to MARC from something like this. And so that's what we have now. The, the, the um, attributes are labeled, um, but mostly it's human readable rather than machine readable. And the rest of the picture describes where we need to be. We need to take that flat human readable description and turn it into a list of machine understandable entities and relationships. And so in this example, we have the entity William Shakespeare, we have the work named Hamlet, a place named New York, and so on. And there are relationships associated among these entities. And so William Shakespeare is the author of, of Hamlet, and, and you can read the rest there. Um, so as we're doing this, why does this difference matter? Well, one reason it matters is that the entity relationship representation is machine understandable. And it's machine understandable, especially if we identify the entities in unambiguous ways. And as librarians, we already know how to do that. And with linked data, we're, we're um, given additional opportunities to create unique identifiers for each of these things. A second reason that this is important is that in this representation, we're connecting our human readable description to the world and it's the world outside what we can understand as readers and what librarians manage. And so, in other words, other groups besides the library community have things to say about William Shakespeare, and they know about New York and have things to say about that. So if we record this information in a common semantic web standard, we're setting ourselves up for the possibility that Librarians can contribute their knowledge about these entities to the world, and other communities can enhance that with descriptions of their knowledge about that world. And so we can learn 
for example, that William Shakespeare and Hamlet is, are also described in various scholarly communities or encyclopedias or standard web resources such as Wikipedia or news organizations, and you can see the possibilities. So that's the overall program that we're trying to accomplish here. And getting down to the nitty gritty of a marked record, let's, let's make this concrete and switch examples. And here we have uh, a marked record that describes the tipping point by Malcolm Gladwell, and it's got a lot of details in it. And it, as our modeling proceeds, um, we, we focus on some of the important entities first. And so to simplify this, um, let's just look at these, where we have the author uh, and the title and a, and a summary and some subject headings. And we, at OCLC, we have certainly done a lot of, of linked data work to translate these into RDF, but so have other, lots of other communities. And so that, how to do that is well understood. But a point that we want to make here is that the actual mechanical conversion of one record to a set of statements is not exactly what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is think about these things in the world, like the tipping point, and we want to gather information about them and end up with something that is like a hub of authoritative information that is much richer than an individual bibliographic record like we saw in, in the original screen. So at OCLC, what we're doing is creating a work description of the, of, of the library resources that the tipping point is an example of. And by mining WorldCat, we end up with a collective hub of all of the things that we know about that particular resource. And here's one result. It's the, the WorldCat Works representation. And now this is something very different from what we saw on the previous screen because now it's entirely um, machine understandable and each of these links refers to a source of information that is much richer than we can represent in one record. And so to start things off, we have a, a URI for the work description itself and then all of these other URIs point to authoritative hubs where we can find out more about the topics and, and all of the other attributes that are listed there. So this is fully represented in RDF, and some of these other points here show that it can be delivered in different formats. Um, so we can do the same thing with person. And starting from that same bibliographic record again, let's focus on Malcolm Gladwell instead of the, the book that he wrote. Now, since he's a published author, he's represented in authority files, and in fact, he's represented in VIOF, so he's represented in authority files throughout the world. And so we get this representation. And from VIOF, we can link out outside the library community to Wikidata, because he's a, he's a popular figure who appears in other contexts. And here, through this simple link, we can identify additional attributes about him that are not in the library metadata. So we know what his gender is, for example, and we might know some things about his family relationships. Or there may be um, languages and, and, and typescripts that are represented in one but not the other. And since Wikidata is structured data that is produced from Wikipedia, we also have a, a human readable description and a, and a photograph that's available from him. So now we've got something extremely rich, and we're also thinking about pushing the concept of authorities for persons even further and thinking about what we're calling a person entity. And with Malcolm Gladwell, the results may not be so obvious from what we have done before, but what we're trying to do is collect all of that information about him and put it together in a form that is, that is viewable and readable and, and you can interact with it in various ways. And that's all well and good, but where this really starts to pay off is when we have um, people who appear in the published record and in resources managed by libraries that are not in authority files yet. So think about journal article authors or the various creators and contributors to 
audiovisual resources who are not who don't have authority files at all. And so our person entity can be viewed as a superset of authority file information that includes drafts of descriptions for people who don't yet appear in library authority files. So now we have something quite rich, these authoritative hubs, and we've, we've illustrated how we would build them up for two of the entities that are important in library metadata. And there are other ones, of course, organizations, places, and, and other ones that you, that you can see in any simple bibliographic description. And what we can also say is that these descriptions are much richer than any individual human readable record. And this data is essentially sampled to create things like the, the person entity view that we have here. But it's actually quite versatile and it gives us the, the, the potential to create customized user experiences that we're only now beginning to explore. But to get there, um, of course, we have to have an abundance of good machine processable data. And to start the conversation on a deeper level, I'm going to hand this over to Karen, and she'll walk us through some examples involving translation. Thank you, Dean. Let me get control first. All right, so I'm going to start with translations. Um, the relationship of a work with an author and its associated translations with their respective translators is relatively straightforward. This diagram captures the relationship in two reciprocal links, one from the original Chinese book in the blue box through its property has translation, pointing with blue arrows to each translation in the red boxes and one from each translation back to the original Chinese work with the red arrows through the property is translation of. A work can have any number of translations, and there can be multiple translations into the same language, as is shown here with the two English translations, and that's why identifying the translator is so important. Now, machine accessible VF, um, machine access to VF um, is, happens far more frequently than by human beings. To leverage all the work done by the OCLC Cooperative, we want to share the relationships we've established between original works and their associated translations with the semantic web. Here's a sample markup of an original Chinese work written by Gao Xingjian, a Chinese Nobel Prize laureate for literature and one of the translations of his work into English. We marked this up with schema.org. There were two new terms we proposed since accepted as, um, as a bib extension to schema.org, shown here, the translator and translation of work. The same process contributes to WorldCat work descriptions. The relationships we're establishing in VF also flow into WorldCat works over time. VF includes XA records. Those are actually uh, what we refer to as police records. They're records we create to force records out of clusters that don't belong and merge clusters that didn't have enough matching points. An XA record indicates manual intervention, where we manually split clusters that represent more than one person or merge clusters that really represent the same person. So in this first case, two different Japanese names have the same romanization. Most sources do not include the kanji of either the author or the works, and the romanizations for the same title differed, so some entries were associated with the incorrect Murakami Haruki. The XA records we created split the two Murakamis apart and made sure they were associated with the correct title. In the second case, my college roommate had written several different works both in the United States and France. Each source listed a different title, and we didn't have anything to match on except her name, so we ended up with three different clusters. She confirmed that she wrote all three, so the XA record merged them into one cluster. And in this case, it's a triplicate for another name, this time due to differences in how the same name is represented by different sources. And it's been reported. It hasn't been merged yet. 
Um, humans are still better at detecting these kinds of errors than algorithms, so we will continue to need a manual override. So let's go to some very concrete examples. It's lovely to see records that include a summary. To present information in the preferred language of the user, we need to know the language of the individual data elements, not just the language of the resource being described. The language of cataloging in a record can indicate the language of the free text fields, such as summaries. So when we transform these summary text strings into RDF, we can provide language tags, allowing us to present information in the preferred language and script of the user. So we have mocked up what a display could look like from the content of WorldCat records. Here we've taken advantage that we have an English language tag summary of an Iceland fisherman, the original in French, displayed in an English interface and with a table of translations and translators of the work. This is the same record with a Chinese interface. Since we don't have a Chinese language summary, none would be shown. Now this is a record of an English translation of a Chinese classical work, a travelogue of a Chinese explorer around 400 AD, but it doesn't say what the original title was, only a note saying title also in Chinese. Well, this one is a little bit better as it gives the romanization of the Chinese title, but it's in a free text notes field. And this one gives the Chinese title in a uniform title field, yay! Of course, I'd prefer to see the Chinese characters, especially since this isn't even the pinyin romanization we now use. But since we group these records into content clusters, it's okay that the other records don't have a uniform title since this one does. Now, when we convert that information into RDF, we can state not only the English translation, but also state the work it is a translation of with the appropriate language tags. Now this represents a kind of gold standard that makes it very easy for us to parse. It has a 041 field uh, indicating the language of the original. It has a uniform title of the Chinese original with the Chinese characters. It has an added entry for the translator with a role term. And be still my heart, it even has an original title entry with a link to the WorldCat record for the Chinese original. Now, it's pretty rare to find an original title entry for translations. In April 2015, only 684,000 WorldCat book records had a 765 field. Only 12,000 of them had a subfield W link to the original. So it's okay. I would be perfectly happy with a uniform title and an added entry for translations, for the translators. Now, Hans Christian Andersen, uh, Snow Queen, which was originally written in Danish, has been translated into many languages. When records for translations do not include an added entry for the translator, we resort to parsing the 245 subfield C using a very long table representing all the ways <coughs> translator or translated by can be written in different languages. So the English translator is easy for us to spot, but we also need to identify, for example, translator in Russian and in Turkish, as shown here. In VF displays, oh, and what is really nice, though, is when you do have the translator shown, always please use the role term. Um, this is a particularly nice example because it not only has the 041, which shows the original in Danish, but it also shows the intermediate translation. This is a Danish translated in French that was then translated into Vietnamese. In VF displays, we're displaying the translators where we can identify them. This is really useful to distinguish the Snow Queen translations into English and into Swedish by different translators. Now, the subfield E terms are language de uh, dependent. This is the list of the most frequently used terms for translator in different languages with some variations. So we have traduction in French, but it's also shown in this table by its abbreviation TRAD. Now this list doesn't even list all the typos we find farther down, the frequency list. Using the subfield for code is language independent, TRL, and we can generate the appropriate label according to the language preference of the user. 
unfortunately, most of the 700 fields in WorldCat, 68%, have neither a subfield E or a subfield 4. Now, for further examples, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague back to Jean for starting with some examples with sound recordings. Jean? Thank you, Karen. We're, we're getting set up here. Okay, thank you. Um, so the work that Karen and I are, are describing, the, the, the projects that Karen and I are describing are works in progress, obviously, and, and we're at the analysis stage. But they, they have some surprising similarities. Um, and, and we discovered them, frankly, in the process of putting together this presentation. So the work that I've been thinking about with sound recordings um, harkens back to my interest in free text analysis, but there are other reasons why sound recordings are especially interesting right now. For one thing, they're very uh, rich in in um, entities and relationships, even if they aren't necessarily recorded in a machine processable fa fashion. A second reason, as this audience certainly knows, is that audiovisual materials are the subject of an important Library of Congress study, who, which, which makes some recommendations about how to enhance DibFrame with vocabularies and models that will produce a, a better understanding, a machine understandable model of this data than you can induce from MARC records. And a third reason is that these kinds of materials are the textbook example of why uh, library data needs to be put out on the web because we have stuff to share about this data but so do other communities of practice. And, and going forward, it would be great if we could link to it. So in, in this example, it, it's, it's a very, you know, unremarkable from the point of view of data, I suppose. Um, it describes a work by Bobby McFerrin and Yo-Yo Ma, and it's a popular musician paired with a, with a classical musician, and that's the World Cat rendering of the underlying MARC record. And here's a snippet of the MARC record. So to point a few things out, there's a 100 field with Yo-Yo Ma in it. There's a 700 field with Bobby McFerrin. Um, they're both identified as performers. And in the 511 field, at the bottom of, this, of the screen, you can see that there's more information about Yo-Yo Ma and Bobby McFerrin, but it's in free text, and that's why I'm particularly interested in this stuff. So as this audience also knows, though, um, all of the WorldCat catalog records have linked data associated with them. And so you can look at the linked data at the bottom of the page and induce the, the model from it. But the model for these kinds of descriptions is sort of unsatisfying because it's missing a lot of stuff that is only human readable. And there's, a con there's, a, there's information about the individual tracks, for example, that is completely missed. So if we look at the linked data model that is there, um, you'll have a, an indication of the creative work, the ma manifestation-like thing that the, that the bib record represents. And then there's a work-like thing that, that represents different ways that this recording could be rendered as, as an LP or, a, or a, a, an audio tape and so on. But then beyond that, all of this rich information that you see here, and all of the, and actually the information that you see in the original MARC record, but only in a free text field, is missing. And so all you get is the creative work with a list of contributors or performers, and that's it. And so you don't know who did what to which track, and really who, who did what to any creative work whatsoever. And so that, that first draft linked data model doesn't have enough machine processable information to do anything much more than this. And that's the problem that we're trying to solve. So 
one thing we note, though, and, and since this is still an analysis project, we haven't actually acted on this, but the, the site Music Brains actually has some very nice structured data for the individual tracks of, of this same recording. And, and, and they're, they do a, a good job of recording this information for all of the materials that, that they try to include in their collections. And so we could imagine that a path towards a better description would be to somehow link to this. And then there are some benefits that accrue if we do that. One, obviously, is that this community has done a lot of the work for us, so we don't have to do it. And the second thing is that users who would come into a, a description of, uh, of, of this object might be coming in through Music Brains, and, and they would be able to then link to the, the library description as well. And finally, it, it just is in a, a, a form that is much more machine processable, and uh, we want to be able to capitalize on that in future work. So just as Karen did in her example, in her data, um, I would also like to work through uh, another audiovisual description that is closer to being machine processable than, than the first one that, that I showed. And so here's, a, 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 again, another fairly simple example. But if you look at the underlying MARC record, you can see some nice things here. So you've got a 100 record, 100 description, a bunch of 700 fields, 511 fields that have um, data in a form that is, that is easily parsed. And there are some subtleties here as well that I'll point out. Um, First, um, the, this material is much more easily recoverable. Secondly, um, the lots and lots of 700 fields, there aren't any role in, um, designators in this because the role designators don't get specific enough. And if all you said was that they were performers, the coding of the 511 field actually says the same thing, that it's a, that, that they're performers and the zero um, at the beginning in, in, sub, in the first subfield is telling us that they're not stage performers, but, but other kinds of performers. Um, another thing is that in this example, possibly unlike the previous example, we have an obvious primary creator who's, who's mentioned in the title as well. And we also have multiple opportunities in this record to record role data. And as Karen pointed out in her example, if you put role data everywhere that it would be allowed in free text or, or whatever, then you end up with a, a record that is actually very difficult to parse because the information may, may be inconsistent. And so here, the, the, the wise choice was made that you use the MARC record standard to its fullest and record it in, in a way that is consistent with the semantics of the field. So a, a research project that we're conducting right now is to try to understand um, how to get the additional, more specific role information out of the 511 field. And so here's uh, an example of some of that out, output, and it's not as difficult to parse as read as it may appear. So on the left-hand side, we have the marked up correct answers, what the parser should have found. And on the right-hand side, we have what it did find. And then the color coding tells us which way the parser messed up. And so on the, on the left-hand side, we have Gene Ammons tenor saxophone, and he was not discovered in, in the parsing results, so that was a miss. And so down at the bottom, we have Bill Cosby host. That's what it should have found, but since this is free text and there are a lot of ways to say things, um, it was actually listed as host for the evening, which would not be necessarily a useful description of host in a, in a collection of, of, of information. So there, there's an, so, so now we've got some fairly good parsing results here, but there's one more 
thing that we would want to be able to do, which is to look at these role names and realize, well, a human has to look at something like Lonnie Hillier trumpet and infer that Lonnie played the trumpet rather than constructed, destroyed, painted, or whatever. You just infer that when you see it. And so some additional processing would have to be done there. But fortunately, in the semantic web, a lot of this work has done, been done for us through a link to Wikidata so that we can know that a trumpeter, somebody who plays the trumpet, is often represented as trumpet in, in individual descriptions. And so by linking to Wikidata, we can get the role names in the form that we need to, to have. And at that point, we would have the information for what would be a much more satisfactory model of this work where we can identify several creative works. So on the one hand, we've got a music event, a thing that was actually performed, then it was recorded in a certain way, and then it was reproduced in a certain way. And so that's what all of the different creative works represent there. But of course, the, the actual performance event is perhaps of greater interest here. And here, with this more specific role information, we can say that Charles Mingus played the, the bat, the, the bass. Um, Milt Hinton did that. Charles Mingus had multiple roles, and you can spell you can spell those out. And so you can begin to see that there are multiple ways to contribute to multiple creative work, and you can keep them keep them apart. And so this is the kind of thing that we're we're aiming for as we try to get a more um, descriptive machine understanding of the data that is encoded in, in these kinds of records. So at this point, um, these are two examples that we're working on right now, and we can see that there are lessons that are similar for both of them. And it turns out that there's a you can arrange them in a, in a hierarchy of from going from least machine processable to most machine processable. And those re then represent um, a list of, of recommendations that we can make as, um, as we continue to create MARC records with an eye now towards turning them into linked data. So obviously what is least machine processable is free text, but if you have to use it, um, make sure that you use standardized conventions and, and terms. Um, in the middle ground, there's this gray area where there are, there are things that are algorithmically recoverable. But in order to do that, um, again, using the MARC conventions to say that the most specific fields appropriate for a descriptive task help immensely because that enables us to assign schema performer rather than schema contributor, for example. Um, or, or schema summary instead of schema description. So what this also says then is if, if you find that you're using 500 fields, that, that would then represent a task for future analysts to try to untangle that and try to understand what the meaning is. So, um, and Finally, I think the, the recommendations that Karen and I are, are making as well is that if you obey the field semantics and avoid redundancy, that, that helps with parsing as well. And beyond that, since we're both looking for entities and relationships and roles, this says in many ways to use the, the recommendations that we've listed there, using uniform titles, using subfield fours rather than subfield E's, um, using indicators to refine the meaning, and so on. So that's the end of our presentation. I should say, too, that this is one thread of work that addresses the question of how to um, make MARC data more easily convertible into linked data. But as we close here, I, sh I should mention that there are other activities going on as well, and, and one that I'll highlight is the, um, the Program for Cooperative Cataloging Task Group on 
adding URIs to records, and I can address this more in questions, but, but just wanted to let you know that, that that's also going on, and, and that would also be um, in the list of recommendations once, they, once the, the work on that committee stabilizes. So to summarize, we walked through some examples of how you can get more structured, more ambiguous data simply from a MARC description without changing the semantics of the MARC record, and in fact using the semantics of the MARC record more strategically. And there are a list of resources, the data science page from OCLC, the book that we've recently published. Um, and so at this point, I would like to open it up for questions. And please submit any questions you have for Jean or Karen via chat to all participants. And we do have one question here from Judith. Uh, Judith, I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm sorry, Ms. Zerba. What might you say to educators at graduate levels of library science regarding the teaching of organization and control, also known as cataloging? As I understand it, most schools have stopped teaching metadata structure with any effectiveness, if at all. Doesn't this lack decrease the ease with which converting linked data from MARC records? As a cataloger, I'm encountering terrible MARC records, often provided by third-party vendors, that library administrators have decided to buy into, as well as the lack of well-educated and accountable human resources to enhance. Um, correct or, I'm sorry, correct or edit these records into current standards. What is OCLC research doing to reach these graduate level educators and library administrators to get the message of changing of a changing landscape of search and retrieval. Karen. Ask Karen. <laughs> Karen, can you address that one, please? Is she on you? Karen? Okay. Um, first of all, um, yes, there are a lot of suboptimal records in WorldCat, um, and a lot of them do come from vendors. Uh, we certainly run into them. Um, sometimes it's actually difficult to find the good examples that you guys produce um, over some of these less than great records. I will say that um, at least as long as the transcription data is correct, we're often able to cluster them. Our goal, our hope, our aspiration is that you, the cooperative, you metadata specialists who are part of this call today, will create enough good records and good data that that will be suffice even though there'll be a bunch of suboptimal records um, that can cluster together and take advantage of the good work you do. It's not that everybody has to do good data, but there at least has to be a good, a representative good data, especially for the most commonly held works. We can't do much for the less commonly held. In terms of the education, I think part of the issue is people are thinking of, oh, you know, mark records and, you know, the resources. If we try to change the conversation, to why metadata is really important, the descriptive, to be able to reach out to user communities. That is um, the way to go. And we're hoping, maybe Jean can say more, but we're looking at um, our colleagues at Web Junction who have been offering courses all along, especially to state, uh, whole states and so forth, to take advantage of the platform they have that might be able, we might be able to use it to have these kinds of kind of courses or um, guides that people can refer to um, that can also be incorporated into library information courses. Uh, Jean, do you have anything to yeah. add? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, Karen, I, I have a, a couple of points. Um, I, I think you covered the, the issue of education very well. That is something that, that we are taking a serious look at and trying to address these gaps. But I, but I also want to follow up on a point that you made earlier, which is that we have a, a collection of high quality metadata already in WorldCat that has been contributed by professionally trained catalogers. And the, the Entity Hub 
processing flow enables us to cluster some of that poorer quality information that we're getting from other sources with these better ones. And we're now beginning to think um, programmatically about how to do that. And so that offers us hope as well. And for people who want more information about that, I, I would give a plug to my, my OCLC research colleagues, Bruce Washburn and Jeff Mixter, who recently gave a, a Tai Chi webinar on the question of inside, looking inside the, the library knowledge vault. And we can put a, a link out through chat to um, connect you with, with that. Thank you, Jean. There are a couple other questions in here for both of you. Um, let's see. So many links are broken within a few years. What will make these records long-lasting and not a bunch of broken links? Well, um, we, we know that broken links are an issue, but one of the things that the link data paradigm forces us to think about in a more rigorous way than people had thought about URLs in the past is that a uniform resource identifier in the linked data world is designed to be globally unique and persistent. And so in the process of publishing URIs, you essentially are signing on to a contract that you are making that URI persistent. Thank you. Um, Karen, I know that Sarah Elman from Columbia has submitted a proposal regarding Chinese rare book IRs. Do you know how OCLC is going to respond to the proposal? Um, no, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. It, that's um, in a different area. It's, um, I'm sure that the proposal went to other colleagues at OCLC, but I don't know about it, so I don't know how OCLC is expecting to respond. Sorry. Okay, is OCLC beginning to use the knowledge gained in its mechanical conversion process to enable catalogers to create linked data? That's also a question that we're being that, that we're addressing as as we think about an education strategy, because we know that it's in the interest of everyone in the community to be empowered with the knowledge to to publish your own linked data, which means that um, you would need to create a model of it if, if it's unique materials that, that you're managing. And then, and then publish the URIs for it. And that's something that we hope to be able to address in some of our, our education outreach efforts. And I also think that a, num a number of the entities that we're creating um, are expected to be incorporated into um, record managers, for example, that would also make it easier for catalogers to create linked data in the future. Thank you. Will OCLC set a fee to show library holdings in a linked data environment the same way OCLC does now with worldcat.org, where a library has to be a first search subscriber in order for that library to appear as a holder in worldcat.org? That, that's a question that I'll have to take to my, my marketing colleagues. I don't have the answer to that off the top of my head. Yeah, all I all I know is that the um, the business model for linked data is still being um, considered and created. So I don't know that any decision has been made about how to how we expect to represent holdings in the linked data environment. Oh, okay, here's a question for Karen. Um, should we be using a subfield dollar four or a subfield Dollar E to define roles in 7XXS or RDA recommends subfield dollar E. Yeah. I know, and the PCC recommendation also recommended subfield E. 
um, over OCLC actually was advocating subfield four. You know, subfield four is better for being able to, it's, it's language independent. Um, and it's not just for other countries. If you think of your communities, especially in public libraries, not everybody will understand English tags either. Um, so a tag that's encoded can be generated into whichever is the preferred language of the user. So I am advocating a subfield, uh, subfield four. Now, Glenn Patton, before he retired, bless him, um, he, he advocated that wherever we saw a subfield E in our records, that we just go ahead and generate a subfield four. Um, because we do have tables, it should be something that OCLC could do to just generate the subfield fours. So, yeah, I mean, I, right now, m more than, it's almost 70% of all records don't have any roles at all. So I'd be happy if you use a subfield E rather than not having a role at all. Thank you. Um, here's another one along those lines. It sounds like you're advocating the use of things like French translator in the 700 E subfield, but isn't that the equivalent to free text since only translator without, without qualification is available in the RDA toolkit appendix one? It seems like taking terms from a vocabulary is more machine actionable than free text, even if the phrase French translator gives the human reader more information. Yeah, I, I, I still advocate using a standard coding for, that can be translated into or generated into whichever language is useful. Um, and I was, the frequency of the subfield E I showed you, those were coming, those are the frequency of the, the values that are actually represented in WorldCat over 100,000 times or more. So even if things change in the future and people are using um, something from the RDA toolkit, it's not going to change the fact that we still have hundreds and thousands of roles that are free text that are often even undecipherable because they're typos. And okay, just to be sure, I understand, when you say human readable, once you have it encoded, then then a machine can generate it, not just T-R-E-A-D or T-R-E-N-S or whatever, you can, you could you could generate a full language tag to say this is the translator or fan yi zhe, you know, in Chinese or han yakusha in Japanese. You don't have to put in the Japanese or the Chinese or the French terms. You just put in the code and then the machine can generate the proper language tag for user displays. Thank you. Okay, the next question is when can we start adding URIs for access points and mark records? So I'll answer that one since I'm on the, the PCC committee. That is a very complex question. And right now um, there are individual projects being conducted at, at individual institutions, but um, the PCC charge is to try to um, rationalize the use of URIs and make them more backward compatible with the semantics of, exist, of existing MARC records. And so um, they will come out with recommendations over the course of, of the project, but right now the landscape is quite complex. And so, for example, we notice that if you put URIs in subfield zero, which is what a lot of institutions do, that works well and good, except that the semantics of the subfield zero says that you can have multiple ones. And if you do that, then what do they refer to? Multiple URIs for the same entity or multiple URIs for subparts of, say, a complex classification term. And that's yet to be worked out what the recommendation will be going forward with, with um, the PCC committee. Um, a second question might be, um, where do you put the URI for uh, a work record? We don't know at this point, and different institutions are doing different things. Another question is that um, the URI can be put in a subfield zero, but not every MARC field that might need a subfield zero in, in the linked data world, or, or a, 
then that, that kind of a URI in the linked data world has a, a subfield zero defined for it. So then what do you do? Do you define subfield zero for all of them, or do you have different ways of recording URIs in those circumstances? So it's quite a complex and messy topic, but um, by working at the level of standards where we can make recommendations about how market itself may change, I think it's being addressed at the right administrative level, and we'd welcome input and, and um, participation in this process. Thank you. Let's see. Can OCLC distribute its schema.org data to local members for local inclusion in web exposed data sets? Unfortunately, that, that's another question that, that I can't really answer. It, it requires um, participation from a a marketing colleague, but I can check with someone and get back to your your chat question within you know the next couple of days. Great, thank you. Okay, this is just a comment, I believe. The question about catalogers creating linked data was about a tool for WorldCat connection users to move from mark to linked data, aka big bib frame. Yeah, and that's why I think um, uh, we can check back with our colleagues who are involved with the record manager and collection manager, because a lot of the entities' work that we're doing is they are trying to move that into um, that framework. The idea, I think the goal is that eventually in WorldCat you should be able to export data in whatever the preferred format is. Mark is still going to be with us for a while. Um, and there's going to be systems that will only be able to handle marks, so OCLC will continue. I mean, we have we produced catalog cards, you know, for decades after most people had closed their catalog. So we, we are going to have to continue to export marks, but if you export, you know, in linked data, then, you know, it's a matter of vocabulary. Be able to support bib so you can get the data in bib frame uh, schema or in schema.org or perhaps some other schema that we aren't even aware of yet. Thank you. Oh, I also see that the link to using schema.org for yeah. library resource yeah. description that's isn't pre working. That's a preprint. We can fix that. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Yeah, I was actually trying to fix it now, but I don't think I'm going to be able to before yeah, yeah, it's can, over. But sorry that. about that. We'll send you that when we send you the um, webinar recording. Okay, here's another question. Is it permissible to use both the subfield 4 and subfield E for IXX and 7XX, the PCC training manual for applying relationship relationship designators in bibliographic records, page seven, has examples of how to string them together. Yeah, I mean, again, I'd be happy with roles, people. I mean, so so few of the records that I've looked at have any roles at all. So put in both, put in one, just put in roles. Roles are important. And I'll take them whether they're in a subfield E or a subfield four. I prefer subfield four, but whichever, or both. Your presentation provided good examples of more machine actionable encoding of data in the MARC bibliographic format. Do you have similar thoughts on more optimal ways we should encode data in the MARC authorities format? I can say a couple of things, and I'm, and, and I'm sure Karen can weigh in on this too. In the book, what we talk about is that in the MARC authorities format, um, the the model that can be induced from that works re relatively well for concepts, but when you start looking at persons and organizations, it doesn't. And so, um, what we would what we would want to do would be to make recommendations for what for using the formats that we have now, and then think further down the road about about a linked data model that goes beyond what the format allows you to do in the same way that we're sort of hinting at that with the AV records. 
So, Karen, do you have anything to add there? Uh, only that, you know, we are also looking into how we can include or link to other identifiers for the same entity. Um, I, I know John is familiar with the British Library pilot that will be matching the entire LC NACO authority file against the ISNI database. And um, I think the estimate to be 4 million um, LC NACO authority records will be enhanced with O2 fours that had given ISNI link. Um, which is one baby step for this. But there are other identifiers out there. Um, BF, of course, does already have links to ISNI and Wikipedia. So, you know, one of the questions is how much do you have to have the work done in an LC NACO authority record if there's links? Since everything that you do in the LC NACO authority file is represented in BF, if BF has the links to other things, and those other things have links. Where do, where, where do you need to put in work where it's not duplicating or redundant to work done elsewhere? Well, thank you all very much. I think we're just about out of time, so we'll wrap things up here. But um, thank you, Karen and Jean, for your great presentation and for all of you for your attendance and participation. And we will work hard to make this webinar recording available um, next week and we'll send the link to the recording as well as the other links um, that we mentioned in the webinar today to all registrants and all attendees as well as post them on our website. So thank you very much for joining us. Do you have any last thoughts, Karen or Jean? I was just going to say um, if your question that you submitted to chat didn't get answered, um, Karen and I will, will answer it over the next couple of days. And you'll respond by yeah, email? Respond okay. by email, sure. Perfect. And, and well, although, I uh, mean, yes, roles is one of my you know, pet concerns, but quite frankly, uniform titles is my other big one. Uniform titles and added entries for translators. Um, well, added entries for, for everywhere where you can put. Um, where, let's face it, you know, there's a lot of data out there that you see that's not so good. You guys, are, you know, on this call, are in a position to make our work clusters better by being having the good record that we can hang all of those suboptimal records against. So um, I would personally like to say that uh, I, when I see these good records you produce, they're wonderful, and just keep doing more of them. That's a great takeaway, Karen. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you all very much. This concludes today's webinar.